Maimonides's notion of the unity of God versus Spinoza's notion of the unity of God, that's definitely one place where there's a clear differentiation. So why don't we spell out what Maimonides' concept of unity is? The next paragraph immediately leads to where this is going to go with respect to the unity of God. And he says, um, this will be a radically different translation. To the same class belongs the rejection of essential attributes in reference to God, for it is a self-evident truth that the attribute is not inherent in the object to which it is ascribed, but it is super added to its essence and is consequently an accident. Uh, if the yes. attribute denoted the essence, toti no eni, right, of the object, it would be either a mere tautology, as if, for example, one would say man is man, or the explanation of a name, as in, for example, man is a speaking animal. For the words speaking animal include the true essence of man, and there is no third element besides life and speech in the definition of man. I added that last part just because I, I like that. But basically, you can see where this is going to go, which is essentially to say, if you think of God as being some kind of substance that has attributes, then you're suggesting that those attributes are somehow not part of God. They're super added. They're accidental, not essential. And to say that God somehow doesn't have what you would consider to be an attribute, that it's something that's added to his nature would be to diminish the concept of God. And so he's going to spend the next few chapters teasing that out, what that means, which is essentially to say God can't have attributes at all. And yet you also can't say of God that there's any particular thing which is essential to him. Essentially, everything is essential to God, right? The concept number does not apply to God. Right. Correct. Yeah. In fact, he says, there cannot be any belief in the unity of God except by admitting that he is one simple substance without any composition or plurality of elements. From whatever side you view it, whatever test you examine it, not divisible into two parts in any way by any cause, not capable of any form of plurality, either objectively or subjectively. Now, he's pointing specifically in this case, he's talking about plurality in this very formal sense around substance and attribute and essences. He wants to say there's a simple substance, single essence, no plurality, no accidental qualities that adhere, nothing you can ascribe to that simple substance. And this is kind of where I think some people have attributed to Maimonides this notion of like rational mysticism or intelligent mysticism, the idea that somehow God is capable of being and generating without having any of that stuff as accidental to him. It's hard. When he writes, it's very clear, but it's hard to grasp <laughs> grasp the concept. Any name, any attribute, any yeah. classification, then you're subordinating God to some sort of, if you're saying that this is the essential characteristic. You know, I was thinking about how he could say in the first part that the one thing about God is that he's a single unity. But in reality, he clarifies that later and says, actually, you don't say that God is a single substance or a unitary substance. You just say that God is not a plurality. That right. That's the negative yeah. way of, of characterizing the same thing. Maimonides coming in, and I'm going to say that the unity of God means that these other stories have to be wrong, right? Because there can only be one being, God, that has existed for all eternity. If there was something else at the beginning with him before creation, then you, that's polytheism. Right. Or at least that's like positing a multiplicity in God. There's God and his attributes or God and his built in, you know, there's some versions of Christianity that interpret the we talk in Genesis, not as the royal we, God talking about, you know, we when he's really just meaning himself, but that that actually was right at the very beginning was Jesus or the Holy Ghost or something was right there with him. And this is all way out of bounds for Maimonides. He got it. That just violates unity. It's, it's, you're not even a monotheist at all. Right. But one of the things that this brought to me, and I'll say this and Danny will know what I'm talking about, is there's a Hebrew prayer called the Shema, or Shema, which says, Here, Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. And it might be the most common prayer. It's certainly said as frequently, I think, as just about any other. Right. I don't think I ever gave any sort of metaphysical thought to what the significance of that was. But tying it into this, I think, you know, I do see that it's basically the constant reaffirmation of the primacy of the monotheistic God over, even though there's no such thing as polytheism anymore. And even in the 12th century, Islam was a monotheistic religion and Christianity is a mono, well, Christianity is debatable, but Islam is definitely a monotheistic religion. According to Judaism, Christianity is idolatry, whereas 
Islam is not. One little historical point. So the very guys that were persecuting, you know, that chased Maimonides out of Spain, this belief in that God does not have a body and is unified, that was something they believed too. <laughs> Maimonides is getting this from the Arabic philosophers, including those bastards that were persecuting him. Well, there are definitely a lot of similarities. I mean, to the extent of, for example, Jews do not have any pictorial representations of God. Same way that it's forbidden in Islam. I don't know. It's forbidden, I guess, in scare quotes in Judaism, but it's just not a thing. There's not a lot of religious inspired pictorial art. There are other forms of creative expression, but, you know, it took the Christians to find a way to actually put a sculpture together of Moses, right? 